Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. On behalf of the Faculty of Science and Technology at the Morning Campus of the University of the West Indies, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 11th stage of the Conference of the Faculty of Science and Technology, Mona Campus. It is great to see you all here. I am assured. I'm assuring you that the warmth of my welcome is to ensure that you feel relaxed. <laughs> well, you will soon warm up as we, <laughs> we, we get into the presentation. And to assure you that we are very, very happy that you have taken the time to be with us this morning and throughout the course of the next three days. Everyone here is special, and we are grateful for your presence. We are grateful for our academic staff, our students, both postgraduate students and undergraduate students, our administrative staff, our support staff, our alumni, our special guests, people from this campus and from the other campuses across the, the, the University of the West Indies system, we are happy you are here. So please feel welcome. You will, will allow me, however, to welcome some special guests who are seated at the front of our room here. We want to acknowledge our Dean of the Faculty of Science and Technology, Professor Paul Rees, um, who is sitting to your farthest to your right. We want to acknowledge the Deputy Principal of the, the campus, the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies, Professor Kawa. And then to your far left, we want to specially welcome Professor Edith Sim, who will be our plenary speaker, keynote speaker for this morning. We, offer, we are very happy that they are here with us to share in this opening ceremony. I will not try to welcome everybody else by, by name in the room because I will get myself in, in trouble. But we do want to recognize our campus librarian as a member of the senior management committee of the campus, Dr. Paulette Carr, who is sitting in the front of the room. The other person we might want to recognize very briefly is that in, at this conference this year, we have four special plenary speakers, keynote speakers. These persons have traveled from a far way to be with us um, and to share in our 11th staging of our conference. We have already welcomed Professor Sim, and you will hear more about her in the introduction. And we also want to recognize in the room Dr. Tyrone Grandison, if he would wave his hand, who is one of our keynote speakers. Dr. Carl Friedrich Schlossner, and I hope I got that one. <laughs> Almost there. <laughs> and Professor Mohamed Henini, who will join us a little later in the day. We are very grateful that they have chosen to join us and be our plenary speakers for today. As by way of opening remarks, I just want to say this conference is a very special conference. Yes, it is the 11th staging of the faculty conference, but this 11th staging is being celebrated in the 70th year of the University of the West Indies, and that alone makes it a very special conference. When you are 70 years, it does afford you the opportunity to both take a look back and take a look forward. And this conference, I think, is going to try to examine the role of science in development of, the, of our nation and our region with a little look back, but a look at where we are now and also a look forward. It is fitting then that the theme for this conference is science for society, science for society fit for purpose, with the fit signifying foundational, innovative, and transformational science. These represent the kind of broad headings under which the science that will be, we will speak about at this conference fall, but also they speak to the kind of science that we think is necessary for regional and national development. It is fitting then that we celebrate this conference, this very special conference under this theme, Science for Society Fit for Purpose.
Lastly then, by way of opening remarks, I have been asked to point out to you that you have a chalk-filled program in front of you with lots of things that are going to happen over the next three days. If there are a couple of things that you are to remember from this program, here they are. Remember, first of all, that this conference is about quality, stimulating intellectual presentations. There are over 40 oral presentations being given at this conference, chosen from more than 100 submissions. There are over 50 poster presentations that will be along the spine, um, again chosen from over 100 submissions. We ask that you take the time to come to the presentations and to look on the posters, engage the authors, uh, the presenters, or the, or the poster, the authors who are at the poster, these presentations will be spread out over the three days, so you will have ample opportunity to do so and learn about the latest research that is being done at the university as a part of the faculty of, of science and technology at whatever campus the research comes from. So bear in mind the wonderful presentations about this that will be a part of this conference. We're asking you to bear in mind that this conference is also about partnerships could not have staged this conference without some key partners. And so as you go through the program, please take some time to acknowledge the sponsors of this conference. In particular, our title, gold, silver, and bronze sponsors. The Caribbean Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Jamaica National Group, the University of the West Indies School for Graduate Studies and Research, the Port Authority of Jamaica, and the Grace Kennedy Foundation. And then, of course, the other sponsors. They all represent our partners as we try to pursue science in the context of development. And then the, another key partnership that this conference has is with the girls in ICT um, session. And you will note that they will be running a parallel session with the conference on day two. And we recognize a partnership. We ask you to note that this, this conference, yes, is about the quality presentations and the partnerships, but this conference is also about public engagement activities. There are a number of activities that we will seek to use to engage the faculty and the university with the public. We begin this evening at 6 p.m. with a legacy talk where we try to put this, the contribution of the science of the faculty in context, and that will be given by Emeritus Professor Robert Lancashire, who we consider the faculty historian. <laughs> and so we are grateful for that. And we ask everybody, and to spread the word, that, that you should be here to put the kind of science that has been done over the last 70 years in context. Tomorrow evening, there is a public forum on effectively communicating science. So we will we'll take a, a, a ta some time to look at how well, we, we know we do well with publishing in our peer review journals. How well then do we communicate that to the public? That's at 6 p.m. tomorrow at the Undercroft of the university, and we ask you to, to make, make note of that. Immediately following that, tomorrow evening, there's a reception, and there's a reception for all alumni of the Faculty of Science and Technology, and friends. So alumni, friends, guests, it's the conference reception and we hope to engage with you in a slightly different way from the academic presentations. And on Friday, we engage our industry partners and our business leaders in both an industry session and a luncheon for business leaders. And so this conference is also about public engagement as well. And finally, if the conference is about the quality presentations and the partnerships and the public engagement, it also has some special programmatic features which we want you to bear in mind. Tomorrow, we will celebrate with the Discovery Bay Marine Lab, their 50th anniversary, in a special session. And we ask you, sorry, today, I'm sorry, this afternoon, I'm very, very sorry. This afternoon, we celebrate with the Discovery Bay Marine Lab, lab on their 50th anniversary of existence and their contribution to science research and we ask that you join us. Tomorrow afternoon, we have a special climate forum looking on climate change research at the University of the West Indies. And we ask that you, you join us for that special focus. 
And then finally on Friday afternoon, we ask that everybody here come back for the Grand Innovation Challenge Finals. This year, we engaged our students, our undergraduate students, graduate students, both in our faculty and across the faculty with their, their academic mentors to come up with solutions, innovative solutions to particular problems that, that are listed and you can read about it in the front of the program. We have the finals tomorrow. The four finalists will present and you must be there to hear these presentations. And so we ask you to come to these special programmatic features. I hope I've convinced you that these three days are really special days and that you must, you, we are grateful that you are here and you can't miss any moment of the next three days. With that, I am going to now ask, turn over, ask our Dean, Professor Paul Rees, to come and give some introductory remarks. Professor Rees. Chair, uh, Professor Michael Taylor, Deputy Principal, Professor Ishan Kumba Kawa, Campus Librarian, Dr. Paulette Carr. I'm pretty sure I saw the Director of Student Services here, uh, but I, I, I don't see him right now. Oh, oh, there he is, hiding in the back. Yes, uh, Mr. Jason McKenzie, who uh, was a member of this faculty and will remain a member of this faculty speakers and other presenters, sponsors, colleagues from the faculty and the wider Mona campus, and I mean staff and students, or maybe I should put it the other way around, students and staff. Participants, ladies and gentlemen all, it's my pleasure this morning to welcome you to the 11th incarnation of our faculty conference. Science for Society, Fit for Purpose. This gratification that I felt was somewhat tinged by distress when I first received a draft of the program. The schedule therein indicated that the Deputy Principal and I had been allocated three quarters of an hour in which to speak. Both he and I prefer short deliveries. So we should be ahead of schedule. We are very happy to record the presence of our, our colleagues and you know, the, uh, I just mentioned Professor Kawa. He's a former dean and he would have been here even if he wasn't representing the principal. This conference was strongly supported by him during his tenure and so it's only fitting that he's here. Moreover, as a soon-to-be former dean myself. It is hoped that I too will be invited back to future symposia. <laughs> Big hint. As you're all aware by now, and you heard from Prof. Taylor, UWI is celebrating seven decades this year. The institution has certainly made its mark in providing access to very many Caribbean students across the whole spectrum of social classes. It has created opportunities for upward mobility for over 150,000 graduates so far. Numbers on this campus and in our faculty continue to grow annually. In fact, FST registrations have doubled over the last decade. My colleagues are also aware that much of the current growth is occurring in computing, which has lately diversified its offerings. The student numbers in that department have doubled over the previous three years. During the UWI's current five-year plan, 2017 to 2022, we intend to do even more to improve accessibility to higher education as this is one way in which we can help the countries of our region achieve their 2030 development goals. 
the Department of Computing does not have the monopoly on reinventing itself. In fact, every department in this faculty has, in recent years, revamped its curriculum to be more aligned with modern international standards and the needs of our people. Another positive step has been the growth of collaboration among our departments. As an example, I have been excited to see that biology and physics, once said to be at opposite poles of science, are not only speaking to each other, but are finding new avenues for partnership. Our new lecture schedule has removed the long-standing timetable clashes between these two disciplines and others. Furthermore, in an effort to produce more rounded graduates, students in our faculty are allowed to read courses anywhere on the campus as long as their major is situated here. During the three days of our meeting, the faculty will showcase its research. The results of its investigations have the potential to improve the lives of our citizens, but we should also remember that they provide opportunities for local industry to forge partnerships with us so as to to develop these ideas into money-making enterprises. And before I hear mention of institutional bureaucracy and red tape, I will quickly point out that our third commitment, the first was accessibility and second uh, alignment. Uh, the third is to create a university that is agile and responsive. So the AAA strategy for our institution, access, alignment, and agility is at the core of our pursuits over the current five-year plan. Challenge us. You won't be disappointed. Everyone here is sold on applied research, that which is geared towards solving an immediate problem or directed at improving a known industrial process. And that is great. However, I wish to put in a small plug for what we sometimes call blue skies or pure research. This type of investigation does not necessarily excite the public, but it is a required endeavor for advancement. There are many examples that could be described, but one will suffice. When micro microwave radiation was first discovered, it was a curiosity. It then found utility in the transmission of radio waves. During World War II, Magnetron tubes were used to generate microwaves for short-range military radar. However, once the war was over, magnetron manufacturers were looking for new applications. In 1946, Percy Spencer, an engineer at Raytheon, was visiting a lab where these pieces of, pieces of equipment were in operation. Suddenly he noticed that a candy bar in his pocket started to melt. Nowadays, that frightens me. If the candy bar was melting, he was getting uh, irradiated. Other scientists had observed this phenomenon before, but, sponsor, sorry, but Spencer had a new idea, and this is at the heart of discovery. Seeing what everyone else has seen, but thinking what no one else has. Spencer set out, sorry, sent out for some popping corn when he held it near the apparatus, popcorn exploded all over the lab. He then put a raw egg in its shell into a kettle, moved a magnetron nearby, and turned on the power. I wonder how many of us have done this with a microwave oven. A cynical colleague nearby peeped into the kettle just as the egg exploded in his face. As they say, the rest is history. Microwave ovens are finding their place in growing numbers of kitchens all over the planet every day. So what starts out as an interesting curiosity only can end up finding many applications. In, clo in closing, it would be remiss of me if I did not thank the co-chairs and members of the organizing committee and secretariat for a job well done. Their names are listed in the program. If there are glitches, blame me. The buck stops here. However, when things go well, don't hesitate to let them know. 
they have worked tirelessly to bring this symposium into existence. We could not have hosted the conference without our sponsors either, and Prof. Taylor has mentioned them by name. The tremendous effort put in by the presenters of talks and posters is appreciated. Moreover, we express our gratitude to you, the participants, for your presence here today. Finally, you'll see from the schedule that we have presentations lined up for you that cover a wide range of topics. We trust that these talks will be well attended, as you've heard, and the posters viewed. I hope that these interactions will lead to fruitful discussions between the presenters and the participants. Enjoy. Thank you very much, Professor Rees, Dean of our faculty. As you have heard, we also have with us Professor Kawa, a former Dean of our faculty and the Deputy Principal of the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies. And he will bring us some introductory remarks and greetings on behalf of the university. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Taylor. Uh, the protocol has already been established, I think. Uh, but uh, allow me to um, recognize uh, a few individuals uh, that I saw in the audience. And uh, on top of that list, I would like to recognize Professor Tara Daskupta, uh, whose uh, uh, love you know, for science and research uh, is uh, legendary. And good to see you, Prof. Uh, Professor Lancashire, who's also love for the department as uh, Professor Rees has indicated, uh, is also you know, quite, um, quite remarkable. These are stalwarts uh, of, the, uh, of the faculty, and we want to uh, salute them. We want to um, welcome them uh, amongst us, and I think uh, all the students uh, that are here today, and those who will be coming in the future uh, will be very happy to see you at gatherings uh, like this in order to get uh, uh, your wisdom. I also would like to recognize uh, my colleague, uh, Jason McKenzie, who is the uh, director uh, of the Office of Student Services. And, um, I'm, I'm making that um, um, a point because uh, before students come to your class and take your exams and, and do your coursework and so on, they pass through a whole lot. You have to imagine those who live on campus who have to come from the dorms, pass through all those uh, uh, byways and, and, uh, before they come to the faculty. And um, during all that time, they've been taken care of uh, by the Office of Student Services and, uh, uh, and Development, and Jason McKenzie um, uh, is at the front of that. And uh, the, the, the unity between the, or rather the continuity uh, between the classrooms and the dorm uh, is, is very, very important and is a key feature uh, of what we are trying to do uh, there. I want to also recognize our, uh, our guest speakers. They have all been introduced. I want to welcome you all on behalf of the University of the West Indies. Uh, I know these guys are going to work you very hard, uh, but I trust that you find some time to, um, uh, to, to, to enjoy uh, the uh, Jamaican uh, environment uh, and uh, certainly uh, all that we have to offer. I want to apologize on behalf of the principal who was supposed to come and give remarks, but unfortunately uh, he was not able to come. And so I, he asked me if I could come and uh, uh, greet you uh, on, behalf of, uh, uh, on behalf of the campus. And so I'm greeting you, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So it's, uh, it's, my, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 11th Faculty of Science and Technology Conference. Uh, this year's conference focuses uh, on the important role that science and technology now plays in developing societies. In many of today's thriving nations, science and technology has become the cornerstone to development and prosperity. Investing in science-based industries has become the key to increase employment, an improved manufacturing sector, an increase in foreign investment, and improved healthcare options for many. Investing in science-based industries and concomitant research and development has also produced varying technological advances that aim to benefit not just regional societies, but also the international community. Innovation and transformational impact of science and technology 
have created opportunities for many developing nations to assert their newly found position uh, on the global business stage. Many developing countries are leading the charge in scientific advancement in the fields of medical research and manufacturing. This while it's giving their citizens greater options to improve their earning opportunities and establish sustainable forms of living by making research and development part of the nation's business approach and dissemination of science and technology outputs as a key strategy for improving citizens' daily lives. Science, technology, and engineering are emerging fields throughout the international community that are proving to hold immense value in the battle against underdevelopment and slow economic growth. Countries worldwide are beginning to place significant emphasis on developing these areas in education in an effort to better able to translate their uses in their industries and manufacturing sectors. The end result is the development of new productive areas in struggling economies that pits them against some of the most economically diverse and strong nations throughout the international arena. Countries like India, China, and Brazil are beginning to invest heavily in these fields. And as a result, they have been able to significantly improve productivity for their nations while also inviting increased foreign direct investment in scientific research uh, and development. I just came back from Cuba last weekend and I was able to see for myself um, the tremendous development that Cuba has made in science and technology. Uh, when it comes to um, uh, even things like nuclear technology and so on, uh, you'd be amazed at how much they have achieved, but also how much they have contributed to assisting other Latin American countries to, uh, to do the same. Uh, we have worked uh, some agreements with them uh, to ensure that some of that benefits could be shared uh, with us as well, and that is building on a visit that we had with Professor Roy uh, last year um, uh, to, to look at their medical and biomedical and biotechnology research. So it can happen, and we just need to play our part. As a leading tertiary institution in Jamaica, the University of the West Indies is committed to developing and enhancing our existing academic programming in science and technology in order to meet the new global demands in science and technology innovation. We are at the page of um, establishing the Faculty of Engineering, hopefully this week um, that, will, that will happen. Um, we established the Faculty of Sports uh, last year, and that faculty in, uh, a, a, engages science and technology a whole lot. Uh, and I would encourage you to uh, visit with the dean, uh, who is a medical, uh, who is a medical uh, 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 lecturer and others, uh, to see how science actually is helping to transform uh, what we see as a, as a, as a sports you know, on campus. So the use of science and the engagement of science in our university is, uh, uh, in, in, is quite diverse. And on the, as the dean said, our next strategic plan, we see us put considerable emphasis uh, on the infrastructure uh, and other areas in the Faculty of Science and Technology. Uh, because we believe that um, in order for the faculty to provide the leadership uh, that is required for national and regional development, it has to be upgraded and, uh, and, and facilitated um, uh, in, well beyond what we have done. Uh, the facilities that we have had, um, uh, as we all know, are old, but we are but working, thanks to you. Uh, but we need to, we feel that it is important to augment what we have uh, with, uh, 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 with the new technologies in order for you, uh, for the faculty, I should say, uh, to play the key role that it must play uh, in the development uh, of our country. Uh, this year's conference brings together a diverse and experienced community of academics, policymakers, researchers, and practitioners who have become critical voices in this discourse. It is therefore sets an exemplary staging ground for our country to begin to look more critically at the benefits of science, technology, uh, and innovation in building our society. And in this regard, um, not too long from now, I hope, um, the science, technology, and innovation policy for Jamaica uh, will be introduced probably as a white paper uh, for discussion. I urge you, when that time comes, to come out in your large numbers to tear apart that policy and ensure that your experience uh, of doing science that you've been doing for so long and achieving so much uh, comes to bear 
uh, on what the country, on, on the road, the country will be embarking on uh, in, in integrating science, technology, and innovation uh, into development. I don't have enough time to tell you how much we have worked how, um, uh, to, to, to get thus far, and also the obstacles that are in the way, both conceptual uh, and otherwise, uh, to get it done. So your intellect is desperately needed uh, to, uh, to, 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 to shape uh, that policy into an instrument uh, that can be of tremendous use uh, to, the, to the country and the region. And I really urge you and urge you to, uh, when that time comes, to organize small groups and, and so on, to make sure uh, that, that, that each word and each line receives the level of attention, uh, of intellectual attention, sorry, uh, that it deserves in order to, 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 to sharpen uh, its ability to, to help us. So on behalf of the university, I gladly welcome all of our conference participants uh, who will undoubtedly enjoy informative and enlightening discussions and presentations. And finally, I extend congratulations to the Faculty of Science and Technology and organizers uh, on the staging of yet another exemplary and impactful conference. And I want also to uh, end by thanking the faculty. Uh, I know, as I indicated earlier, that the uh, conditions we are all working in are less than ideal, but we continue to produce papers of high quality. Uh, we continue to produce graduates of high quality, uh, particularly uh, research, research graduates. You continue to lead the, uh, the pack uh, in terms of uh, uh, research, uh, re research degrees uh, that are produced at this university. So I want to thank the heads of departments who have to deal with all of these uh, uh, issues and maintain productivity and excellence uh, in the face of uh, financial challenges. I want to thank the supervisors, the lecturers, the, uh, uh, the administrators, technicians, and all of you, uh, not least, of course, our students, uh, who keep the engine uh, of research and innovation uh, in, the faculty, uh, in the faculty going. And it is remarkable also to, um, to, to, to note that persons who work in the faculty uh, whether they are academic or not academic, research uh, is vital. And I'm looking at my colleague from the library uh, who received an award for excellent performance you know, this year. She's a librarian. Uh, and yes, she received the principal's award uh, this year for, the, for excellence in the research, um, research output. And I know that there are other uh, groups like technician, te technologists and others uh, who have also uh, been contributing uh, enormously uh, in, uh, uh, in, in advancing the faculties uh, in the university's uh, um, agenda. And so you have truly owned the Faculty of Science and Technology. It is your faculty. Uh, it can be seen. Uh, it's, it's quite evident. And therefore, uh, I would want you to, I, would, I want to urge you uh, to continue um, doing what you have been doing, uh, innovating as you have been and, uh, and, and, and I'm quite sure uh, that the university and the country uh, will be the better you know, for it. And uh, uh, your efforts are not going to be in vain. And I wish for you a very happy and uh, memorable conference uh, over the next uh, two or three days. Thank you very much, Professor Kawa. Let me just add one more welcome to those that have been offered, for we have with us the husband of our keynote speaker, the other Professor Sim. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and we're very grateful that he came and accompanied our keynote speaker this morning. <laughs> and has allowed us to work him a little bit <laughs> during the conference. So our keynote speaker this morning is Professor Edith Sim, Emeritus Professor of Pharmacology at the University of Oxford. And she will deliver her keynote speech to us now, but only after she has been introduced by Dr. Delgoda, who is the Director of the Natural Products Institute here in the Faculty of Science and Technology in, at the Mona campus. And she will tell you that there is a little personal connection. I hope she doesn't mind me saying between herself and the Professor Edith Sim she was her PhD student, and, and so it is only fitting that we invite her to come and do the introductions.
Thank you, Chair, um, Faculty of the Science and Technology Dean, Deputy Principal, Professor Sim, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the 11th Faculty of Science and Technology Conference. Professor Edith Sim is a dis distinguished academic leader with over four and a half decades of globally impactful research applicable to the pharma and biotech sectors, and she's an effective advocate for greater inclusiveness in science. Professor Sim started her career with a first class honors degree in biochemistry from the University of Edinburgh in her home country of Scotland, UK. She completed her doctoral degree at the University of Oxford and thereafter began a long and illustrious career at Oxford. Commencing as a lecturer in biochemistry, Edith became a Wellcome Trust funded senior lecturer and professor in pharmacology at Oxford, eventually became, becoming head of department and growing it to accommodate approximately 200 faculty members, academic researchers, postdoctoral fellows, graduate research and administrative staff. Through her strong leadership Edith's department expanded to eventually have an annual research budget of four million pounds and was rated as the best department of pharmacology among all universities in the UK in 2008. In 2011, after approximately 40 years at, as, at Oxford, Edith was headhunted to become the Dean of the Faculty of Science and Engineering and Computing in Kingston University in London, where she integrated three faculties into one and raised their life sciences research income tenfold to a total of over 60 million pounds. With, with a track record of transformation in higher education, Edith is also passionate about promoting research scientific opportunities for underrepresented groups including international graduate students, women and teenage children. She was the chair of doctoral training panel for UK's Medical Research Council, and she's currently actively engaged in the National Saturday Science and Engineering Clubs with Sorrel Foundation, and is a trustee of Daphne Jackson Trust, supporting those who have had a career break to return to research. These commitments are no surprise, as I have known Edith to be a deeply caring individual with a strong sense of social responsibility, having been a graduate student under her stewardship. I also recall Edith's dedication to her work and her ability to motivate and inspire her students. We, the students in the lab, easily recognized her fast-paced heels coming down the corridor early morning with a bubbling keenness to follow what exciting results we may have generated the day before. She found it hard to curb her excitement when conclusive results were get generated and her keen intellect would allow her to apply what we may seem like most mundane results for wider value. <clears throat> Such were the experiences of over 50 PhDs she supervised. Edith's research has left an indelible mark in the field of drug metabolism. Some significant accomplishments are producing the first three-dimensional structure of the enzyme aralamine n acetyltransferases, which enabled all insights at molecular level from her lab. Establishment of the relationship between these enzymes and susceptibility to various cancers, including bladder and breast cancers. Expression of these and related enzymes in microbes, including pathogens such as mycobacterium tuberculosis and microbial drug resistance that has also been unraveled. These are just but a few mentions of her deeply probing and widely impactful research, which has been published in over 200 scientific papers and several books, and one which I understand is being published today or oh, comes to market today. And her research has been cited over 11,000 times. For her research, Edith was awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Aralimine Acetyltransferases Workshop and the John Vane Medal for British Pharma 
of the British Pharmacological Society. She has been elected to fellowships of the British Pharmacological Society, the British Toxicological Society, and the Royal Society of Biology. Not only has Edith produced scholars and accolades, but she has also been involved in the translation of her science to establish a drug discovery university startup company called Summit PLC. Her research on these enzymes has investigated potential drug targets and diagnostic markers useful for the pharmaceutical and biotechnological industries. I'm sure you will agree with me, therefore, that in Professor Edith Sim, we have the perfectly qualified person to address our faculty's conference with the theme, Science Fit for Purpose. It is her first time here in Jamaica, so please can we all give Edith a warm Jamaican UWI welcome. Everybody, no one was hurt, were they? <laughs> I, I'm ready to say it. you step something out. Yeah. Okay. Is it on? Will it come up now? Will it come up now? Lovely. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed for the welcome. And also, uh, thank you very much indeed, Rupika, for uh, these lovely words. It's been a very warm welcome so far, and I bet you thought you were going to get someone slightly different to this old lady. But <laughs> and I just was reflecting when uh, you said that um, uh, 70 years was a time for looking forward and looking back. So I'm almost that age, and so uh, I can afford certainly to look back, which is mostly what I'm going to talk to you about, but I'm also going to talk to you about things that we have done relatively recently. So um, I hope I can get the uh, tone in relation to translation. I'll do my best to uh, do that when I come. So this is where much of the work was done uh, that I'm going to talk to you about today. It's in the Department of Pharmacology in the University of Oxford. And this tree here, um, if I can get the right button, is now up to here. <laughs> Okay, so um, I've also worked at the University of Kingston. I thought it was very nice. Uh, I was very amused when I took that post and got in touch with Rebecca to say that um, we were really more connected than before. <laughs> so um, this is a list of the different people who have funded my research. And I think the important point in relation to this uh, conference in the faculty is that this here was a university organization which sponsored people uh, to do innovative research and uh, one of the other important aspects is the number of charities that have been are involved in doing funding research in the UK not just big ones like the Wellcome Trust who funded me for 26 years but small ones this one here for example sparks is um, it's a charity which is actually um, stars uh, such as uh, Greek runners and so on who put money into research for funding uh, diseases in children but also the important point is this here summit, this was the spin-out company, and one of the other aspects that's been very important is where the government and private sector will co-fund things, and that has been very helpful. Obviously, if you're going to get co-funding of anything, it's very difficult to get these people to agree, and um, nobody says it's easy. But actually, if you don't have government helping with the private sector working together, then that makes life rather difficult. And I think that's a really good way forward because everybody gets more bang for their buck 
than they did before. So that's why I wanted to show this. Um, I also wanted to say that the work I'm going to talk about has got a lot of people involved, in particular, of course, Rupika, uh, who was a DPhil student with me, and that was a great experience. All of these people have been very, very important. And this is Rupika, which she had not seen this until <laughs> yesterday, <laughs> on her graduation day. And these were uh, her uh, DPhil examiners. So I thought you'd like to see that picture. <laughs> <laughs> now, this book was actually published yesterday, and uh, a lot of what I'm going to say, some of it is very esoteric. I'll, if I see you're sleeping, I'll try and move on, uh, but I might get a bit excited about it. Um, but the important point is that if anybody wants to, this is a commercial break, if anybody uh, wants to know more about it, then really most of what I'm talking about it, not everything, but most of what I'm talking about is covered in this, in this book, which is with another DPhil student, uh, Nicola Laurieri, who has also collaborated with um, Rupika and her colleagues. So, how did I get involved in all of this drug metabolism, this funny enzyme called the Rylumine N-acetyl transferase? Well, it all started off really from work that Bob and I had done, my husband and I had done, looking at the way the body handles immune complexes. And um, these uh, can become deposited and you get a condition called systemic lupus erythematosus, or SLE, in which immune complexes get deposited in small blood vessels. They, you can see it in the face, but obviously if that happens in the kidney, it's not funny. And so this uh, was a condition which is brought on, sorry, <laughs> which is brought on uh, when uh, this drug is taken in some instances. And what happens is that one of the adverse effects is that these complexes get deposited. And so that was what I was interested in looking at that as a model of drug, or not of drug, of um, environment gene interactions because not everybody gets it and this is a way where you can actually identify what the environmental factor is because actually often it's quite difficult because environmental factors are present in small amounts but when you're taking large quantities of a drug you know you've done it and so you can try to uh, dissociate this and what we found as we had predicted was that Hydralazine blocks the, this is the, uh, an assay for immune complexes, and hydralazine blocks this happening, but the acetylated metabolite, its main metabolite, uh, here does not. And therefore, um, we wanted to find out uh, whether this would give some idea of who was susceptible and who was not. But it actually turns out that although we looked at a lot of different polymorphisms, that this enzyme, NAT, which was known to be polymorphic, was the most important one. Now at that time, this was a long, long time ago, I think this might even have been 30 years ago, and this was certainly pre-genome, that was for sure. And uh, what, uh, so what I set out to do was to try to understand everything I could about what this polymorphism was. What does this enzyme do? Well, this here is isoniazid, and this is very important. Isoniazid is still the frontline drug in treating TB, and what the enzyme does is it takes acetyl coenzyme A, uh, which all of the biologists in the uh, audience will know about, but this is what it's like, and it adds an acetyl group onto the onto the hydrazine group at the end. And uh, this is known, was known at that time to be polymorphic. And here you have the pattern which was done, this was work that was done in the 1960s by Price Evans and showed that there was a polymorphism. So uh, what we wanted to try to understand uh, was how did this polymorphism arise and in the interim, <laughs> this was in, uh, about uh, five years ago, uh, we were able to show the binding of hydralazine into the active site 
uh, of the enzyme. Very nice work by Arij Abu Hamad from Jordan. So what we know now about NAT is that there are actually two enzymes and that these, these bars show the signs of polymorphism. So it's a, a very polymorphic, uh, both genes are very polymorphic. They're also on the short arm of chromosome 8 and this is a highly polymorphic region. So much so in fact uh, that um, studies have been done looking at the pattern of polymorphisms for anthropological studies and that's been very interesting work. So what we wanted to know was why do, how do these mutations in these genes um, affect the ability to acetylate uh, drugs. And so um, we carried out structural we carried out structural studies and also looked at expression of the enzyme in tissues. These are the mutations listed here and you can see that some of them are, con for those of who are biochemists, some of them are conservative, some of them are not. The non-conservative ones are really the ones that block the activity as does the introduction of um, a stop codon, which makes a shorter uh, product. So this was the beautiful structure uh, that we obtained in very nicely in the year 2000. It made the millennium very nice for me because I've been trying to get crystals of this for 15 years, which was quite a great thing when we got them. And this was work with uh, Martin Noble and we were very lucky that it was published in uh, Nature Structural Biology. And uh, Rupika played a huge role in uh, this work. And um, this is what the key feature that we found was how this enzyme works. And how it works is it's got a catalytic triad of cysteine, histidine, and aspartate. And this catalytic triad makes this yellow blob, the cysteine, very active, and that allows it to carry the acetyl group that is then transferred onto the, uh, the drug. This here shows how we did the crystal structure by binding a brome acid analyte onto the uh, active site cysteine. It actually, for the chemists in the audience, it has an F19 and also a C13 label which we incorporated so that if we couldn't get a crystal structure, we'd be poised to do multidimensional NMR. That was the plan. Uh, but we didn't need to do that. We got the crystal. And so back to this, we've got all of these uh, mutations. Humans have two functional gnats. They're all very similar in structure. But even though they're similar in structure, then the active site whole I love these pictures. They're just so beautiful. And this is of one enzyme. This is of the other one. You can see it's very different, but they've got this pointy bit in the middle. And the same is true of the two different human enzymes. They have different shaped holes in their active site. And this is what allows the two human enzymes to have different substrate specificities. And that is important because although there's two of them, they do different jobs. So again, these are the mutations. And what we found is that the slow acetylating uh, mutations, what they do is they actually stop the protein uh, being produced. This is a control, but this stop the protein being present, not produced, being present. And uh, how does that happen? Well, what happens is that when you have the mutant protein that instead of being distributed throughout the cell, it's actually punctuated in what are called agrosomes. And these are proteins that are on their way to being degraded. And so what happens is that if the protein isn't properly folded by this mutation, it gets put into a dustbin inside the cell and thrown away. And so you can't find it. And that makes uh, for the slow acetylating type. Now, so human NAT2 is the standard drug metabolizing enzyme. It's found in liver and gut, genetic polymorphisms for fast and slow acetylators. 
the, the slow proteins unfolded and the slow increases the risk of hydrolysis in SLE and it also increases the risk of bladder cancer. So, in order to study this other enzyme, uh, we uh, wanted to look in um, different organisms and this shows the difference in substrate specificity. These details don't matter, but you can see that we could also use mouse and mouse is interesting because it has also a third gene and I'll just show you this is the human and the two genes and in the mouse there is a third gene in the humans there is a, a, a pseudogene and it doesn't have any activity at all but in the mouse there is a gene which between different strains has got a whole range of uh, different mutations now um, we started investigating the mouse gene and the human NAT1 and the mouse equivalent are wide, have a widespread tissue distribution unlike the drug metabolizing enzyme. They have a wide distribution that expressed early in development and we thought they had an endogenous role. This uh, is for uh, the aficionados. It's a comparison showing that the C-terminus is very important. So, how did we go about that? We used two different kinds of models, a transgenic model with overexpressing human NAT1 and a deletion uh, model. That was before CRISPR, uh, quite some time before CRISPR, and it actually took us eight years to generate the uh, gene-deleted mouse. And how we did that was instead of just taking the, uh, the gene out, we actually put uh, an interrupter in the middle of it and the interrupter that we put in was the LAC-Z gene, which allows you to effectively stain for the presence of the protein where it would have been, where it would have been expressed. And so you can see this is a, a rather gruesome picture in some ways, but it's a very nice one in others, uh, because this is the wild type, this is the heterozygote, and this one here shows that the, where the NAT would have been, the NAT one would have been, uh, is blue. Uh, by staining for the LAC-Z gene. So it's in the skin and we also find it in the developing neural tube. Now the important point is that the nat knockout mice, they seem to be quite healthy, although of course uh, some of the studies we've done uh, with a long, long, longer duration, uh, there are some differences have appeared. So other mice uh, have a kinky tail and uh, what we've, th this, mu this pattern with a kinky tail is actually something that you often find in folate deficiency. You find uh, that uh, there is a neural tube defect. And so we observed this and one of the things that we have found is that by looking in the urine of um, mice um, which have and have not the NAT gene, uh, we were able to show that the, the deleted mice differed in folate catabolism. They did not have this um, derivative of folate and they did not acetylate this in vivo. And so one of the other things we found recently is also that um, uh, the, the NAT1 gene is responsible for the hydrolysis of acetylcoenzyme A, which brings together the intermediate metabolism uh, focus of acetyl-CoA, which is a sort of a universal metabolite, and folate. Uh, so that, we felt, was very interesting. Some studies showing the hydrolysis of acetyl-CoA in the presence of folate, and these were done uh, by an NMR time course and we saw your lovely NMR facilities yesterday where um, the uh, lady looking after it was telling us about doing time course experiments which was very nice and um, so this ability to hydrolyze uh, acetyl-CoA in the presence of folate is only with human NAP1 and the equivalent mouse enzyme other ones don't do that and so since that's the one that's early in development, it seems as if it might be important. 
uh, we'd found the same sort of thing when we'd done truncated versions of acetal uh, of uh, N-acetal transferase, and so we looked at the acetal CoA binding site, and uh, this very interesting thing we found is that actually folate and acetyl CoA can be superimposed on each other and you can actually bind them, uh, you can actually model the binding of folate into uh, the binding site, uh, the acetyl CoA binding site of the protein and this shows it here very close to the cysteine and this is it here. So what we propose is that the uh, hydrolysis reaction, acetyl-CoA binds, coash falls off, and then folate binds into the acetyl-CoA binding pocket and results in the uh, release of acetate with the hydrolysis having happened without any arylamine being present at all. So um, just to comment on gene expression studies, which others have done, um, this is a heat diagram, and it shows that human NAT1 is overexpressed in male breast cancer. And we have also observed the same to be true in um, uh, female breast cancer. So we have um, the uh, ER positive tumor, ER negative tumor. I understand that in uh, Afro-Caribbeans, then a triple negative um, breast cancer is more common. Uh, NAT is not it uh, does not appear to be expressed in ER negative tumors. But you can see this pattern here. And this has been very intriguing. And this is a summary of what we found about NAT1, linked to folate and acetyl-CoA homeostasis, and is overexpressed in ER positive uh, tumors. So what we've tried to do is uh, to summarize this uh, uh, exogenous uh, NAT1 is uh, detrimental during development. Could we use it as a, a diagnostic marker? And uh, my colleagues in Australia have observed that ablation of NAT1 uh, impedes uh, cancer growth, and so was it a therapeutic target? These uh, observations le led us to do a high throughput screen to look for inhibitors, and obviously this has always got some kind of translational value, very, very important. And uh, this is the screen, you can see, this is where something's happened, this is where it hasn't. So if you're going to do anything in a high throughput, you need to have a very easy uh, assay, so you can say yes and no. You can't be dithering around with 25% in the middle. Uh, you've got to move on. And from this screen, we were able to identify this compound, which from, uh, <laughs> from an intellectual perspective is very exciting uh, because it, is a co it, color, it changes its color specifically when it binds to only our ligand. And it has one binding site, and you can see that it's only to these ones which are equivalent that the color change occurs. With any of these others, it doesn't. And so um, it also inhibits, actually, the uh, folate uh, hydrolysis reaction. We've been able to show the binding uh, and to s understand why the color change occurs. And this has been proposed, it's been published in JAXA and was proposed for a biomarker detection. We have recently been trying to improve the um, uh, potency of it. And you can see that through um, organic uh, synthesis, we've been able to have uh, a more than 70-fold difference in improvement in this. And we're looking at fluorescent markers. This is a very nice young guy called James Eggleton's been doing that. So that's what I've told you so far about the arylamine n acetyl transferases. And I'd now like to say a little bit, I'm not quite sure how my time is going. Um, am I doing all right for time? Yeah, okay. So um, the... Um, we, I'd now like to say a bit about the work we've done on gnats in mycobacteria. Remember I mentioned at the beginning that the enzyme uh, acetylates isonized this anti-tubercular agent. Now this is uh, M-tuberculosis and it has an important uh, lifestyle 
inside alveolar macrophage. Now, gnats from differing organisms can ha have different uh, functional roles. And what we have found to, uh, concisely is that gnat and mycobacteria appears to have a role in cell wall synthesis. Now, how we started out these studies is we thought that it might be that since uh, gnat we found was present in mycobacteria, that if it acetylated isoniazid inside cells, it would stop isoniazid acting as um, an anti-tubercular agent so that it could be important in resistance. That's why we started these experiments. So we generated a knockout, and what we found was something very different. We found uh, that the knockout grew in a different colony fashion altogether. When we put the gene back, uh, it returned. We also found that the ultrastructure changed from this cord. These cords were not present, and the transmission EM showed that that was also the case. Phospholipids were not affected. But um, we showed the other complex lipids, these are the ones that make these cords, they were vanished, and they came back when we reconstituted. We also showed that inside cells, without NAT, the, the mycobacteria didn't survive. So that suggested that this was going to be, uh, also we didn't get mycolate synthesis, so this suggested that actually NAT might be a rather useful um, target for anti-tuberculars, and that started a whole load of new work. So we, the same through high throughput screens I've shown you before, we used that, and we came up with these compounds. I'm going to say a little bit about both of these, which inhibit, but in very different ways. The, uh, the important point is that the chemical inhibition has exactly the same effect as the gene knockout. And so it suggests that we're onto the right track. This is an overview showing with this compound, the triazole, uh, that there's no mycolates, no cod factor, but that the phospholipids are the same. And we have some uh, SAR on NAT and also on inhibition, which suggests that they're similar. It's not toxic to cells itself, uh, but it does block the mycobacteria inside the cells. So not cytotoxic to the macrophage, but killing the mycobacteria inside it. This shows the modeling of this into the active site of M. smegmatis gnat. And so we were able to show how that uh, inhibitor fits in with the gnat structure. This is the other inhibitor that we've looked at, which is a piperidinol. And what we have found is that it's specific um, for, um, this is the percentage inhibition. You can see it's specific for um, prokaryotic gnat and doesn't work on a human gnat at all, which of course is what you want when you're developing a drug. You don't want it to be touching your human enzyme. Um, and what we've been able to do through crystal structure is to show that a fragment of the peridinol is actually bound to the active site cysteine, which is a very nice study uh, carried out by, again, uh, Arij Abu Hamad. And this is the fragment that is released when the peridinol interacts with the mycobacterial gnat. So um, this is a summary of what I've just said. Uh, the alteration of gnat expression affects the growth alters the morphology, inhibits mycolic acid synthesis, increases the sensitivity to other antibiotics, which I haven't shown you, and also um, acts on intracellular killing inside macrophage. Now, um, the, this, a lot of this work was done in collaboration with Summit PLC, and um, the uh, chemical inhibition uh, replicates gene deletion, and the NAT inhibitors were uh, transferred from Summit PLC under license to Eli Lilly. Now, I'd just like to say a little story. This is really a little story about Alaya Madikani and the pepper bark tree. And Alaya Madikani was a, a, a Sainsbury scholar, 
again funding from another, or another source altogether, uh, who came to my lab bringing with him parts of the pepper bark tree which is used for um, herbal treatment of respiratory infections in South Africa. And um, he brought these extracts, uh, which were extracts in acetonitrile, and uh, it was shown that the crude extract inhibits the growth of M. bovis BCG. Importantly, it also inhibits the growth of M. tuberculosis and doesn't affect the growth of E. coli. So that shows some degree of specificity. And uh, this here shows a fraction, fraction 30, uh, which was uh, an HPLC fraction, which inhibits uh, the growth of um, BCG. And this is the time course here, and this shows uh, the two after the longer period of time. It also, fraction 30 is selective inhibitor as well as the uh, crude extract for um, BCG, but not for E. coli. The studies were also done with a gene-deleted strain, and you can see that here, the gene-deleted strain, and although there's inhibition of growth by fraction 30 of the uh, wild type, there is no inhibition of the growth of the NAT deleted strain. These are the uh, compounds that were identified, a range of these, and this one here, as well as the crude extract, were shown to inhibit NAT, uh, but um, compound one also is active in, this is a time course, against, with different concentrations of um, the compound one. So, the crude extract and fraction 30 inhibit NAT activity. Compound one is a NAT inhibitor, but it's less effective than both the crude extract and fraction 30. And we talked about that in the Natural Products Institute yesterday, that sometimes when you purify, actually somehow synergism is lost and you can lose activity as well as gain it. But fraction 30 um, inhibits growth of M. bovis BCG, but not the delta NAT strain. And so these actually suggest that inhibition of mycobacterial NAT contributes, doesn't prove that it is it, but it contributes to the anti-mycobacterial activity of Warburgia salutaris. So the NAT fold supports a range of enzymic activities We've discussed about NAT as a breast cancer marker and mycobacterial NAT as a target for anti-tubercular drugs. Now, I'd just like to say something very quickly about more recent work that we've done. The NAT enzyme is in an operon in mycobacterium, and the whole operon seems to be important for survival inside cells. And so we've looked at this one here called HSAD, with the same kind of a, approach. And what we've, we've got a crystal structure of it with substrate bound. And why I wanted to tell you about this is because the active site of this enzyme is very big. It's a very big active site. And this is ideal for a way of determining uh, new drugs called fragment-based drug discovery because you can try and fit a whole load of different things inside this hole. And so how you do that is you do it by a combination of differential scanning fluorimetry, which you can use uh, a real-time PCR machine to do these studies, and look at the, um, uh, the shift in the melting of the protein in the presence of this. And you could use NMR also to show that something has bound. And so we found two interesting compounds, two and six. And with these, we've been able to show that they bind in an overlapping way in the active site. It's not a drug, but what you then do is you build out chemically into the active site to improve the 
uh, inhibition that you observe. And HSAD, for a whole range of reasons, I think is a really excellent TB target. I've been in touch with GSK screening about this and also have done these studies in collaboration uh, in the early days with a group in Vancouver who have a lot of work on these. So that's what I wanted you to, to say to you. And I'd just like to show you a picture of Rupika giving a talk at the Department of Pharmacology in Oxford some years ago. And finally, I'd like to leave you with my, a word from my first boss in the pharmacology department, Sir William Payton, who was an amazing pharmacologist who developed this triple gas mixture to allow exploration of the deep seas. Very amazing man. And he said to me, when I got the first results on hydralazine-induced lupus, he said to me, now Edith, all you need to do is don't lose your nerve. And I would like to pass on that uh, piece of advice to all of you, especially the young ladies in the audience. So thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Sim. Professor Sim has kindly agreed to take two questions. <laughs> I think we have time, time for two questions. If there are, anybody has a question that they would like to ask. I see a hand there. Um, Excellent talk, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask, have you tried your drugs against other mycobacteria like nocardia? Um, we have tried against a range of different bacteria and the different enzymes, uh, the enzymes from a range of different mycobacteria have uh, different substrate specificities. We spent maybe four years working on the enzyme from Mycobacterium marinum and we've also worked on the enzyme from Mycobacterium smegmatis yes. and Mycobacterium uh, uh, bovis and BCG, uh, bovis and uh, tuberculosis are the same. And with these, and also with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, we've looked, we haven't looked at Nocardia specifically, okay. but we've looked at uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And with these enzymes, we find that the differences in specificity profile, uh, we've got a way that we can look at that. Um, are subtly different uh, and um, it's very important that if you're uh, raising drugs against something that you actually use the one that you're going to be it's going to be going against in the clinic because a lot of the work that we did with M. marinum although it is 90% similar to M. tuberculosis we used it because it was much easier to work with that yes, uh, um, a lot of that data didn't hold up when we looked at the uh, M. tuberculosis enzyme. I hope that's helpful. Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more question. Or there's a question down front from <laughs> the former student. <laughs> you need a microphone, yeah. Edith, can, for, the, for, for the benefit of all of us scientists, can you distinguish between academic research? When <clears throat> did some of this work become patented? When, when did that process happen and when did the private sector company, the Summit PLC, get formed? And what's the relationship between this, <clears throat> with, with Summit and the university? You mentioned Eli Lilly. We'd, we'd really appreciate, I think, to understand how pure academic research then all of a sudden became translated into a commercial company and what these relationships and how these things are formed. Yeah. Okay. Um, you did ask me to say that, and I'm sorry I, I didn't. Um, but uh, the patents were uh, ISIS Innovation. That is the universe. It's not called ISIS any longer. For you can understand why, uh, because there were so many cyber hits. It was unbelievable. Uh, but it's now called Oxford Innovation, and that company is actually a a cluster of companies and uh, which provides consulting but above all it will help uh, 
academics to um, go to patent agents and will pay for uh, preliminary patent data throughout my life. I've maybe had seven or eight of these, not hundreds like you get in chemistry, uh, but uh, small numbers of patents against uh, a range of different things, uh, other work I didn't talk about today, anti-arthritic drugs and so on. Uh, they've been very helpful in supporting the patents, uh, the patent process, paying for the patents uh, up to a certain point. But once the patent goes international, it becomes very expensive. And therefore, the plan there is that ISIS Innovation or uh, Oxford Innovation supports you to uh, get other partners in. Uh, the work that we were doing with um, anti-tubercular uh, agents was one of the first compound, was one of the first projects that was um, used to set up the company called Summit PLC. Now, in that, uh, although I was a member of the founding panel of that, the person who founded it, maybe known to the chemists amongst you, was an amazing character who did his PhD at the same time as us, a guy called Steve Davies. And he is larger than life in every way. And um, Steve uh, had already uh, founded a very successful uh, company for making chi chiral compounds uh, called Evatech. It's now called Evatech. It started off its life as Oxford Asymmetry. He is a very rich man. And he wanted to put some of the money that had come in. He sold this company for um, in the early, when was it, Bob? Be about, <laughs> he sold the company for well in excess of £40 million. And he wanted to put some of that money back, his personal wealth, back into the academic research. Uh, and so he used some of that funding together with the support from ISIS Innovation and all of the wrangling that you can imagine over who owns what. Uh, obviously, it's not an easy thing, but he is a serial entrepreneur and is a risk taker. And he uh, then put the money in. There were a couple of projects that started it off. One was to look at um, uh, treatment for uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And um, uh, the other one was this one, which was uh, uh, hived off to Eli Lilly. The Duchenne muscular dystrophy project is still ongoing. And uh, they've also looked at now uh, treatment for uh, Clostridium difficile. And these uh, projects, the company is still going. And uh, the, the, the pattern is that once that happens, as happened with Oxford Asymmetry, it gets bought over by a big company and then move on to the next thing. So that's how that came about um, with uh, obviously the people who work in that company. Once a company gets to a certain size, a biotech, you don't want academics there at all. You want entrepreneurs there, people who are business people from outside. But having said that, is it okay if I say a bit more? Is it okay? Am I? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, the other interesting point is one of the people who worked with me on um, the, uh, the NAT work in the early days is someone who Rupika knows very well called Mark Payton. Now, he's a very interesting character. Mark Payton had, had a patent, uh, as it wasn't nothing to do with his name, but he had a patent as a postdoc, uh, which was a diagnostic test for diabetes. And um, when he came to me, he was involved in the patent of the uh, anti-tubercular agents. Because of his interaction with ISIS, with um, uh, Oxford Innovation, they offered him a job. And he took that job. I was a bit sad at the time, but I could understand it because it was a great opportunity for him. He then... Um, did an MBA, and he now runs a venture capital company worth nine billion pounds. And so uh, that uh, sponsors a lots of different projects. Uh, it doesn't sponsor 
It sponsors diagnostics. It doesn't sponsor drug development. And um, I know that later on in the week, people will be talking about the difference in the time scale of these different things. Uh, but his company sponsors a whole range of other things, including projects of some of my um, colleagues at Kingston University, where he has sat on the uh, faculty advisory board uh, of the science, engineering, and computing uh, faculty at Kingston in the UK. He came and sat on that board and through his venture capital company is uh, sponsoring some of these projects. So, uh, but also through small industries as well as through spin-outs. So, is that, does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor C. And just to assure you, Professor Sim is with us for the entire conference. So if you, and she's very happy for you to engage her in conversation outside of, of the room. We're going to invite Ms. Shanice Wop, who is a graduate student in biochemistry, to come and say thanks to Professor Sim. Dean and uh, Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Science and Technology, heads of the Faculty Conference Committee, keynote speaker, plenary speakers, colleagues and friends, good morning. It is with great pleasure that I take this opportunity to extend our gratitude to you, Professor Sim, for taking the time to attend the faculty's 11th annual conference as our keynote speaker. I found it very fascinating when I was researching and I found that you have published over 200 papers and although we are just four months into the year you've already been cited about 200 times I found that very interesting you are indeed um, a very knowledgeable person on the Nazi you're actually considered to be the most knowledgeable person in the world as we can see from her presentation <laughs> Yesterday at NPI, we had the opportunity of meeting with Prof. Sim um, in a one-on-one -on -one fashion, and we were able to share some of our projects with her. The insightful feedback you gave us will no doubt enhance the quality of our research. And as Prof. Taylor did just now, I'd like to extend an invitation to anyone who would like to get some insightful feedback as well to engage her because she's very knowledgeable in a large, like, a vast majority of areas. Um, indeed, your presentation was very informative. I was particularly fascinated about um, finding out that NATS is overexpressed in breast cancer, which is something I am working on, and how you brought out that it could be a useful target for anti-tuberculosis <laughs> drugs, as well as an excellent target for the HSAD um, enzyme for drugs as well. So once again, Prof. Sim, on behalf of the faculty and the university, I want to thank you for being here with us and I hope you enjoy your stay in our beautiful island. And as a token of our appreciation, please accept this gift. Thank you very much. Thank you. I enjoyed their talk yesterday. <laughs> This brings us to the end of our opening ceremony and our keynote presentation. We invite you to join us for a coffee break on the spine outside and look on some, begin the looking on some of the posters. And in 10 minutes exactly, we resume in this room with the first set of presentations. Thank you.